Hey everyone, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat, a podcast recorded on Gaia Margo land by me, Liam Miller, he, him, his, a minister in the Uniting Church in Australia. Uh, my guest today is Eve Rebecca Parker. Uh, Eve, Eve, welcome along. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, having me. Oh, no, you're welcome. Um, for those who don't know, Eve Rebecca Parker did her PhD, in, uh, finished in 2016 at the University of St. Andrews, uh, is a postdoctoral research associate in theological education at Durham University. Uh, her recent publications include The Virgin and the Whore, An Interreligious Challenge for Our Times, and uh, the soon to be coming out Trust in Theological Education. And today we are talking about her book, uh, the Theologizing with the Sacred Prostitutes of South India Towards an Indecent Dalit Theology, which is out now with Brill. And folks can pick that up wherever you pick up books or get your theological library to pick it up for you. Um, Let's we'll start with the book. So, so this is a a big project um, that that you know in, involved you know field work, and I think on the back it's talking about you know in, uh, ethnographic, anthropological, theological, hermeneutical, historical analysis. Um, how did you get you know the idea that this is something you wanted to spend a bunch of time exploring and researching and writing about? And uh, I guess how did it kind of I guess take the shape that it has now taken? Talk to us a bit about the journey of the book, I guess. So I love that long list of words because they're basically to give off an impression of sounding intelligent. So that's that's just to, <laughs> to rule that out before we start. Um, it's The book came about because of work I was doing at the time. I, I left university and I was working with an organization called the Council for World Mission. It's a missionary organization. It used to be called the London Missionary Society. And they have been doing lots of work on decolonizing mission. And part of the project I was working on at the time was um, on Dalit theology. So I got to go and travel in, this was over 10 years ago now, travel to Tamil Nadu in South India um, and work with a place called Tamil Nadu Theological Seminary, where they were working on Dalit theology programs. So that's how I became first off involved with Dalit theology. It was a missionary program called Training in Mission, and it was for people basically from all over the world to come together to focus on issues of justice in theology. And um, from there, sorry, this is probably a long-winded story. No, no, no. From there, the started working. <laughs> from there, started working on different projects um, all around the world. But with this, I, I met this Dalit theologian called Philip Peacock, who's fantastic, and now working with the World Communion of Reformed Churches. And together we caused lots of trouble um, in the church. We started working on socioeconomic justice issues with the WCC and various other things, but it kept coming back to Dalit theology. And mm -hmm. Philip invited me to come to Delhi um, to speak on, um, give a paper on Dalit theology. And at the time I felt, and I still feel absolutely unqualified to, to speak on the subject, but it, it went well. And then I became more and more involved with Dalit justice issues and Dalit advocacy. And so I decided, at some point during this time um, to actually do a PhD on Dalit theology. And the reason why Devadasi, so the reason why focusing on Dalit sacred sex workers is because I started hearing about this situation in which Dalit girls were being trafficked and Dalit girls were being forced into this form of um, sacred sex work. And, and as I discovered more about it, I discovered more about the injustices that were going on within this system. And so, and the complexities, because it was also looking at the ways in which the role of the goddess played, and it wasn't clear cut, it wasn't simply, this is an issue of injustice, it was okay, actually, here's a live religiosity that is full of um, hypocrisy, but also full of actually living and working with a goddess that seems to serve the poor, and then you've got, got this the role that Jesus plays within this narrative and where it's actually complex in itself and the church is both a, a, an oppressor but also a liberator so I thought ah this looks exceptionally con complicated why not focus on this for a PhD <laughs> and yeah. that's how, a long waffly story about how this topic came about. Yeah great thank you for that so I guess for folks who for, like myself who where they started to read this book this is all new ground talk to us I guess a bit about the you know the context of this um, sacred sex work, this um, the Devadasi, and, and and like a bit about because you kind of do a bit of the historical work in the early part of the mm. book, talking about you know the, the form it took, maybe pre um, 
colonization and the particular shape it, it took under British colonization and now within reform movements and all this and and just you know I mean obviously you know don't give away the farm you know to go the whole hog but like just just helping us to kind of situate exactly the, you know yeah the context of within the which these women that you're beginning to uh, engage with in this in this study. Mm. So I think with the Devadasis um, what you have is history in a sense being played out on the bodies of women and you see that throughout these various times of history that you refer to so you've got mm -hmm. ways in which traditionally these women were perceived as sacred um, wives really wives they, they were married in ceremonies to goddesses local village deities and they had these quite prestigious roles within the temple and then during colonialism their role was changed in the sense that the British epistemology couldn't fathom this role of women in the temples as dancers doing this. They saw it as immoral, impure. And so the role of the, the sacred sex workers, the, the Devadasis, was transformed in part as a large part as a result of colonialism. Um, it became to be seen as this impure practice. And consequently, the women who were being dedicated to the goddess who weren't always Dalit became Dalit. So those who referred to mm. as untouchable. So those from low caste, the poor, and the role changed entirely because they were perceived as impure. They took on the role as um, so-called prostitutes. And it would be Dalit women who were exploited in the process, sacrificed at a young age and forced into this, um, what is now known as sacred sex work. And so what we have is so the term, I just covered the term, the term Devadasi literally translates from the San Sanskrit as um, sacred, um, a servant of God, servant mm -hmm. of God. And the idea then was that they would be servants of God, but wives of the whole town in the sense that they then could be, they were available for exploitation by the entire village. So you can see how the roles transformed mm -hmm. to their contemporary state, where it's mainly Dalit girls who are now being dedicated to the goddess and reason being again is that so, so it's very complicated sorry um hmm. it oh, what, sure. what 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 happens now is that you have um the role of the goddess as well has transformed because the goddess in herself was seen as impure and an untouchable outcast goddess so you have yelama and mathama local village deities who for the high caste will see them as not equal to their goddesses mm -hmm. they'll be seen as less than and then you have the church that also holds a position of power that sees them as less than so consequently the women that are dedicated are also seen as less than so you can see how mm -hmm. the role of the goddess has been displaced as has the role of the women um so there's, there's mm -hmm. significant implications for that which leads them to their contemporary form so now you have young girls being dedicated often exploited when the village tires of them they're then often trafficked into mm -hmm. cities urban areas and so their role has completely changed um, within that time you had reform programs where the idea was that these young girls would then be married off as a means of saving them from this practice but again that changed because you've got a patriarchal response to a patriarchal problem <laughs> um, where marriage is seen as the means of escape so you could have again a lot of domestic violence happening a lot of mm. young women just being married off to another form of exploitation so that response didn't doesn't necessarily work either but that's where the role of the church is quite confusing because I don't know if you remember from the text but within in this book I share one of the women's narratives that constantly plays in my mind and it's this story she said um you know you tell me to accept Christ but Christ doesn't seem to accept me the church, they, they give me one meal a day. When I was a prostitute, I got three meals a day. So you have these very real situations where a woman who wants to feed her children is mm. being told that she's immoral because of her role as a sacred sex worker. Then she still has to feed her children. What, no, and, and this notion of morality has been imposed by mm. colonialism. So she lives in the midst of all of that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think, you know, and, and taking that last kind of point, I guess it, it comes to, so the book, you know, obviously people might have picked up from, from the subtitle, you know, in, using indecent theology that, that Marcella Altathreid plays, plays a, a particular role in, in the shaping of this project. And um, like Altathreid's, you know, famous critique of liberation theology was, you know, just the ignoring of 
sex, the ignoring yeah. of, of, of of people's sexual lives and the complications there, you know, and 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 complexities and everything therein. Um, and I guess part of this is you know, book is also looking at the way that you know Dalit theology, Dalit liberation theology, also potentially has you know, a, a similar kind of gap um, or, 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 or missing section in, in the way that it approaches the, these women, particularly those, as you say, who in the complexity of actual live religiosity um haven't you know converted in the tr traditional sense of the way we understand that of a complete renunciation turn and and change um so yes yeah, so i'm curious a bit about that, that that you know again how you're trying to you know working with these women and thinking of this book as its relationship to what you know is, is it kind of building off or pushing further um mm you know within what, it, what the work that is happening or and has happened so yes at house reed plays a central role i mean i call her my queen within theology <laughs> she she um as you as you'll know from reading this is is it has highlighted the role that sexual narratives should yeah. play in liberation yes. theology and the way in which they've been silenced and so dalit theology as a form of liberation theology um, does what Art House Reed called other liberation theologies out for, for silencing the sexual narratives of the oppressed. And what we see in Dalit theology is exactly this, this, this process of decency that takes place within a lit form of liberation theology in that the sexual narratives of the oppressed are missing. And yet, as Art House Reed rightly calls out, what they, when you open that closet, as it were, of, of the sexual narratives of, of the oppressed, you open up a world that, of, of injustice. You, you, ha, you see in the Devadasi narratives, for example, that it's not just about sex, it's about the injustice of that. It's about yeah. it, it, their sexual narratives expose caste discrimination. They expose racism. They expose a history of colonialism. They expose the injustices of neoliberal yeah. economic society. And these are the narratives that if you ignore them, you ignore those social realities that are often leaving behind the scars on the bodies of women like the Devadasis. And, and for me, what Out House Reed does and what the sexual narratives of the Devadasis do is enable us to have to be epistemologically disobedient. Now, this this is this is a term that Magnolo um, talks about, right? And he he highlights the fact that by being disobedient, the epistemologies that own that we know to be true, we actually start to be challenged by the lived experiences of the oppressed. And that's what you have here. You have the bodies of Devadasis who are the most marginalized, presenting us with a theology that would otherwise be silenced because. It, it exposes sex, it exposes caste discrimination, it exposes the failures of the church to focus on the actual experiences of women that need three meals, not one meal for their children. So it's these very lived realities that, that for many within the church might seem insignificant, but actually it calls the church out. Their, their mm. narratives call out the hypocrisy of the church. They call out the failures of reform movements. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. So and and also for sorry, no, and no, also no, no, forces no. to see this side of multiple religious belonging that mm. that that's apparent within the narratives that you know for the Christian Church, particularly in the West, where we have this systematized understanding of our faith, it, it goes against the grain. It goes against mm. everything we know to be true, and so it's just seen as mere superstition. Mm. Whereas in the way that the Devadasis go on living, in the way that in their temples they worship the Devi local village Christ alongside Yelama and Mathama. It's mm. it's it must be so frustrating to the <laughs> to the systematic theologians who would rather <laughs> side <silence laughs> these stories. Yeah, I definitely want to come back to the to the, to the multiple religious identities and the hybridity thing. But I guess you know, as you say, you know, actually exploring these lived experience opens up and and challenges the way that you know just the assumed um, you know sexual politics behind so much of everything that's gone um but also how that then begins to open up how we think about scripture so you so you have a great, great chapter mm. where you kind of um you know you talk about the, the the particular nature of sexual violence um often employed metaphorically um in in scripture um you talk about you know ezekiel 23 um uh 
but as you say, like you know, or, or Hosea or, or other spots. Uh, but as you point out, like you know, metaphorical language still has political implications. Absolutely. And I think a lot of what you're saying is, you know, if we, if you're, you know, these this language about you know the whores and the harlots um, that come through in scripture and and the you know God endorsed or God sanctioned or God voiced violence towards them, um, you know, when you're reading when this lived religiosity is in the foreground of our reading and our thinking like that, that 100% shifts how we read that and think about that and who's voiced and unvoiced. Oh, you, the Levite concubine is another um, uh, mm. a passage you read. So, so, so talk to us a bit about, you know, that, that chapter and a bit about this, you know, the way that, that theologizing with these, with these women begins to like, you know, trouble and disturb and, and reshape some of this quite a lot of scripture mm. so the text as you highlight they what they do is they present this um almost a justification for violence against women mm. so mm. as you as phyllis triple as you know referred to these texts as the horror texts and what we have in the narratives of the Dalit women who I talk about and the Devadasis is the lived reality of these stories, that these are not just mm. fiction, they're not just based on some um, mythological world or ancient world in which violence against women is enacted and justified divinely. What we have is the reality that this happens on a daily basis, particularly against Dalit women. So rape within the, against Dalit women is often used as a punishment for speaking out. Uh, I think it, the statistics are something shocking, like, uh, I can't even, I think it's like three women, three Dalit women are raped every day. And, and these, and most of the Dalit women who are raped, the police do nothing about them. There's this culture of impunity that exists when it's violence inflicted against Dalit women. And the reality is that stories like this are, are not just specific, are not just, are not just only in the context of South India, but we know that violence against mm. women happens in all over the world. I mean, in the UK where I speak from right now, it's a hot topic, sadly, at the moment, because a police officer raped and murdered a woman. Um, but that story got in the paper, right? But what you don't hear about is when it happens to women from working class backgrounds, when it happens to black women, when it happens to... So what we have here is this dichotomous notion of women that's present throughout these biblical passages that you refer to as well, where we say that some women are deservant of violence because of their social stature, because of who they are, because of their caste background, because of their ethnicity, because of their class, they are seen as less than, right? And then they're polarized against the so-called pure woman, the, the one that the British would like to, during colonialism depicted as white, middle class, middle upper class, educated, but silent, knows her place. So you have this dichotomous notion of women running throughout history, but it's justified in scripture with mm. the Virgin Mary on the one hand and Eve on the other. And you have, and you have that throughout. So you have the daughter, for example, in Judges 19, you've got the daughter who was seen as more worthy than, than the concubine, but then you've got men who are seen as more worthy. So you've got these dichotomous relationships running throughout. And what you have with the Devadasis is women that are seen as impure, impure and therefore worthy, as it were, according to society, of being socially marginalized and receiving this violence. And so reading the text in light of that reality meant it gave voice to the concubines of scripture. It gave voice to the women who are nameless throughout, silenced throughout. And the horrors are brought to life in a very tragic way, but in a way that needs to be done. Because if you silence the narratives in scripture, if, they peep, if, if, if the concubine remains without voice and story, it's easy to pretend that it's just fiction. Whereas mm. you give her a voice, you highlight that these narratives are happening now, the text, the injustice of it is brought to life in the bodily violence that's happening against Dalit women and women all over the world who have been silenced and had their testimonies of of violence silenced, mocked, marginalized as well. So, mm. yeah, I think, yeah, reading scripture in that way, because also we have to start shaming scripture almost. I think we have to turn shame on itself in the way that scripture has been used to silence and shame the bodies of women. We silence and shame the narratives that have been used to justify those acts of violence. Mm. And so you build the chapter then to go to the, uh, the story of the, 
the woman who anoints Jesus' feet, who, you know, who, who comes in uninvited to the, the, the home of the Pharisee and comes to Jesus and weeps at his feet. Um, you know, and, and, and I like that you have a as we talk about how, you know, she's, she's the one who becomes the cleanser, um, mm. being in the, the ointment. And, you know, she, she, in her tears of protest, you know, bring, bring forth the tears of all those kind of unspoken, unrecorded, tears uh throughout and then uh, i was trying to find the great bit there was a, but you basically talk about you know it is in this act well you know and jesus affirm you know affirms her as she sees her as she is and doesn't try to then reclassify her to anyone but that jesus is confronted with you know the violence against these women against mm -hmm. the violence against this kind of um category of unworthy impure women um and in that there is a between the two of them in this moment the, this beginning of a of a, of a resistant um impulse or trajectory that can be picked up that that you know reaches back and and liberates a bunch of women in scripture and also provides something for for as you say women today all over um so yeah. i really like that move into that um that reading of that again which comes from this kind of lived experience or you know reflecting with a, a lived religiosity mm -hmm. and and i one of the the reasons why that text i i love that text i think it's so powerful in its liberative like quality as it were mm -hmm. because it brought to mind one of the there was the conversation that's not actually mentioned in the book but that was happening i don't know if it's actually i should know um that's that <laughs> that's mentioned um where a woman there was a, a, a member, a church minister, who was um, saying some, something rather insulting about um, the Devadasis in front of a woman who was a, De a Devadasi. And she rolls her eyes and she walked out. And then mm -hmm. later she made everyone tea apart from him. And I was like, yes, that's like, because <laughs> these, these little acts of resistance, right? The, mm. the ownership of who you are and not having to change and actually this way that we can humiliate those who seek to oppress and that's what happens in this biblical passage where the, you've got this woman walking in unannounced uninvited to the home of the pharisees mm. like that takes such bravery right mm. and then the fact that i can you can almost visualize the pharisees in the corner like whispering to themselves <laughs> being like oh it's her the sinner and then and then you've got her falling at christ's feet in this like mm. rather erotic moves that take place yes that um where she's she's got hair down this loose woman and bathing the feet of christ in her tears like everything about it goes against other um other narratives that we read where it is an indecent narrative an indecent and liberative narrative and and i think that has a lot to say um for the situation with the devadasis and it's about not conforming to a new form of oppression but being able to live and express their own faith in who they are and not being judged in the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's great. So we talked, we, we, we I um, shelved, I'm taking off the shelf now, the, the conversation about like um, religious hybridity uh, and multiple religious identities. Because I think, as you say, that's kind of the key to, if, okay, if we're going to actually move to this indecent Dalit theology, uh, a theologizing there's an a in there it's very hard mm. to do when you're speaking <laughs> it's clear on the text um at this theologizing of that, that that requires an attention to you know the ongoing role of the goddess um mm. in these religious lives and as you say if it if it just gets sheared off um then there's a huge swath of religious life and experiences just that that goes with it um and, and as you know, you, you, you know, you, you bring, you cite different, you know, um, quotes from interviews, you know, where it's, it's just like, you know, it's just all held together. Um, but in a way that is, you know, so much about, well, it's, it's, it's just embedded in the lived reality and the daily struggle. That's what Jesus is for, right? That's what the God is for. It's for getting you to the next, you know, in the, in the midst of the true struggle. So it's a very immediate and intimate and personal relationship but it, but it is, and i think that is something that's really interesting in the mix of it all um you know that again troubles so much of how you know cate neat categorizing and why it feels so it should be so easy to move from one to another but but it's it's all just so enmeshed in the the, the everyday life of it all so so we came to talk a bit about 
about that yeah religious hybridity and particularly i guess how you see that as as this linchpin i guess to the to the in to the move toward indecency mm -hmm. i think when you you nailed it when you said it's personal it's it's mm. a personal lived religiosity and it's not lived in a way that we have to systematize it that we have to say i believe in this doctrinal way of understanding christ instead in the context of the devadasis what you have and this is where it links in with the indecent as well is that in the temple there is the goddess Yelema and the women for example will pray to the goddess when they're about to get their period or to help yeah. with period pains and and that and remember that in the context of uh the caste system blood bleeding is seen as impure as you have that with uh, within other faith religions too but particularly so you play to a the goddess Yelema about what's deemed as an impure mm. act so it's seen as like in many ways as an impure goddess in the process right mm. and then you have in the same temple jesus a local as deemed as a local village devi goddess mm. where you will pray for different things so um matama who's mentioned in the in the book she prays to jesus for um food for her family she'll pray to jesus for the basic amenities to survive in life basically for protection from smallpox but she'll also pray to the goddess for this and so it's it's a relationship with the divine that responds to the daily needs of a people who are suffering mm. and this is what's also at the heart of liberation theology in many ways that the god of the cross can relate to the suffering of the people and therefore is the god of liberation and is very much the same within the relationship with the goddess just as it is in the relationship with Christ and there's no reason in the Devadasi understanding as to why we can't worship both the goddess who knows the suffering of women and God Devi Jesus who knows the suffering of the people too both are seen as a means of liberation in the here and now because the truth is that the kingdom becomes less relevant when you just need to survive day to day and so whilst the promise of the kingdom is to the Devadasis, Dalit Christians, also central, so is survival, so is resistance, so is mm. liberation from caste, not just in the kingdom to come, but in the here and now. So you have this hybrid live religion that's responsive to the daily needs, and it's communal as well, because it's not just based upon the individual. People will come to the Devadasi to pray for relief from smallpox. And so they'll have this different relationship with divine, mm -hmm. with the divine than other people within the community do. So you have this yeah, very complex religiosity that to the Western lens is just unimaginable almost. It just, it doesn't, it, it doesn't commute, communicate because we've been indoctrinated as it were to believe that you have this very systematic monotheistic way of understanding our relationship with Christ and and anything outside of that is has been traditionally seen as heathen right we have it in our text we have it in our missionary narratives they worship these heathen gods we have been almost brainwashed to think of other religions as less than our own mm. and so the live religion of the Devadasis is in many ways a way of decolonizing Christianity in its lived form because by being by existing they challenge the ways in which we've come to know Christ and Christianity mm. um so yeah I think I think for for many reasons the the lived expression of Christianity is liberative and it moves us towards this journey to the indecent because just as Marcella Outhouse Reed talks about this notion of post-colonial Christianity going beyond that this is a form of post-colonial Christianity mm. in its lived form mm. and yeah yeah I think that's really great and there's this sense you know again that in that lived, lived reality this is like a you know again that personal that like you know Jesus is mine in this sense of not and thus no one else's but um and that's there is you know a sense of my ability to shape what that is um you know so not just the church's Jesus but but my Jesus you know and there's a very famous song that we all have been singing in churches a long time that starts like that isn't it my Jesus my savior um so you know there's this sense of um but again I think what's interesting in that is again how that shapes I guess a certain fluidity 
or transgressiveness in the gender of Jesus? Because because you kind of talked a bit before about how you go to the goddess for a female mm. issue, and you go to but like there's also this sense of you know because there's this question of or can the male god offer anything? Um, and I, yeah, that, that, that's one of the women's you you know science says something to that um, mm. extent. And and Altus Reed obviously has you know talks about the historical limitations. So the limitations of, of, a, of the historical Jesus. Um, but there's this sense that because there's this search of personal and intimate and, and a kind of openness to how Jesus understood that, that then also Jesus can be more present to or more, 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 more understood more broadly in order to speak to a, a, a wider array of um, need and struggle. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes, so in the local village of South India, the goddess plays the central role. It's the goddess, not the god, the goddess who plays the central mm. role. And so situating Jesus within that context, if you were to situate as, as a man, is instantly problematic. Mm. Okay, Then he comes as this colonial other. Right. Whereas situating Jesus from the lived experiences of the Devadasi, when you speak to the Devadasi women, they understand Christ as Krista, as, as the goddess, mm -hmm. as, as a woman. And again, that relates to the fact that because of the violence against women's bodies that men have inflicted, it's very hard to understand how you could go to a male god with such personal issues, mm -hmm. whether that be, I mean, lots of the women that I met and spoke to, it was situations of rape, sexually transmitted diseases, um, pregnancies and and going to a male god seems almost unnatural with these yeah. realities whereas going to the goddess who could relate to these bodily realities made sense mm. um i also like the way that that jesus is kind of um there's this language of you know jesus existing within the brothel of another god um mm. Uh, or goddess, sorry, uh, within the brothel of the goddess, and and that being, you know, again, this indecent place to start theologizing from, right, from mm -hmm. a brothel to begin with, from from being present to and and enmeshed in these, you know, what would be classified as you know messy sexual lives or whatever indecent sexual lives, um, but again, how that is, you know, when you're starting from that, that just just so much is completely open to be upturned right um both, mm -hmm. both within you know yeah the uh, heterosexist hegemonic kind of um christian tradition from the tradition within the culture of the brahmic um kind of mm -hmm. um caste system like it, 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 when you, you're beginning there as you say the, the, that lowest and least place and begins to overturn it but in such a um yeah fruitful way is what comes out through that through that chapter so importantly and i think which is great um but yes yeah, it's just such a as you say like it's, a, it's a place that it's spill I, I like the language use of it spilling over from these aspects of life um yeah it, 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 and, and beginning the project there definitely and i think the aim here is to also acknowledge the fact that so we've, we've been built our knowledge and understanding of Christ is almost built upon a lie, a lie that it's not situated, that it's somehow universal, and it hasn't come from some Western understanding of how we need to understand Christ. Whereas here, there's an honesty in which this knowledge is, is formed and situated in a brothel. And locating that, it means that we can't conceal the geopolitics of this knowledge and the biopolitics of this knowledge. This is a knowledge that is shaped and formed within the sacred sex workers brothel. That's how mm -hmm. we've come to understand mm -hmm. God. And, and being honest about that is something that we don't often do in the West. We don't often say, here's a knowledge situated from a white middle-class body. This mm -hmm. is my, like, because there's a lot that comes with that, right? There's a lot of mm -hmm. biases. So it, it that that's the shift and that's what you get in Marcella's work and that's what you get in the work of other liberationist theologians this honesty about our own situated reality and what that means for our understandings of God and so a brothel theology is about coming out with the sexual narratives it's about owning those spaces mm -hmm. and saying this is what has shaped an understanding of the divine yeah. where's your brothel mm. oh that's so good and I think like, you know, it is that, like we lose that, like, you know, 
so much of theology and all that is is built from you know the lived experience people trying to work stuff out right like you know even yeah. even back to like you know the the great councils and creeds is because people were like well we're trying to talk about jesus like we, we find it this is how we talk about jesus and how we sing about jesus but that's starting to make some claims that we're not sure about so now we can let's try to hash this out a little bit and and then you come to something and then the i then I guess the thing we come to then is we start having these things that it's like, well, theology is developed here and now is then, sh- now is going right. to shape the religious life. Um, not realizing that well, it was the religious life that shaped it, right? Because if, if we weren't right. feeling that Jesus was somehow still present and worthy of that such adoration, then we wouldn't have had the questions of so many of the early questions. And so he, you know, it's this acknowledgement of, well, why doesn't it go backwards too? Like, why doesn't it keep moving and, and, and toing and froing in that these are religious lives that that are experiencing Christ in a, in a, in a truly real, personal, present way Absolutely. in the midst of struggle? Why isn't that kind of also, like, <laughs> why can't that be also what informs doctrine? Um, Absolutely. And, and the way we think about things. Um so yeah, I think that's really vital and vibrant, and and, and again, yeah, is exactly is acknowledge that this is a situated knowledge, but as all is. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess a, a question I've thought about. You know, this book came out. Um, it's been out for a little bit now. I mean, and, and I mean, probably and, and was finished in an earlier form, obviously a bit before that. So some time has passed. How have you found it? Like now, you know, on doing other work in completely other context with all the other demands of um life and the strangeness of locked you know all the things that happen do you find it still is shaping or or provoking or prodding you in in ways that you maybe either wouldn't have anticipated when you began it um you know because obviously this is again it's very situated but like why doesn't it also come this way and 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 shape us all as i hope it will for many of our listeners um yeah i'm just curious about how 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 it lives with your work ongoing that that's a really good question because um it's been playing a significant role um so since then i ended up getting a job um this is not this was before this um te- training people for ordination so doing the theological mm-hmm. education for people training for ordination in the church of england and part of that was teaching um on missionary movements within the church and world christianity and the books that i got passed over from the previous lecturer were shocking i mean shocking <laughs> like it was the most colonial nonsense and then so not I'm not saying that mine isn't nonsense but it's not colonial (laughs) so so it's just it's not it's not nonsense by the way please do buy it um but (laughs) there's the I I ended up teaching um this module on world Christianity and I wanted to show how it's possible to decolonize teaching world Christianity and and decolonize Mm. missionary movements particularly for those training for ordination within the Church of England which is the epitome of empire in many ways right so it was about um so I taught aspects of the narratives within the book as a means of explaining to the students this is how this was the role of the missionaries this is what happened what do you think and then so brought it as part of brought it into context as part of a pedagogical process so Mm. that those information would realize again going back to their own situatedness within the church and what that means within the wider church and what role the church of england has played in narratives of oppression and how can we then respond to that in our own theological formation and so it continues to play a big role Um, a lot of the work i'm doing at the moment is on the issue of theological education and how in many ways it can't be trusted because we've been given these um, certain ways of knowing that actually goes again that is very colonial in many ways and it's very much gendered around a male way of knowing and so how we need to start to distrust these forms of knowledge and that came about through my work with the Devadasis because I often say that in my own theological education, I, w- I, I went to the University of St Andrews in Scotland for all of my uh, um, theological education. And it's very much to a large degree within the belly of empire. And so it's, and, and I didn't actually, I don't believe gain a true theological education until my work with CWM. It was in the slums of Chennai. It was in Manila, in Smoky Mountain Manila that I came to truly understand God in my life, that I came to, mm. To, to really understand different ways of knowing Christ 
and that went beyond Bart. Not that there's anything wrong with Bart, but th 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 there is more. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, thank you. That that's that's great to hear. And I, I maybe we should, I should get you back on again to talk more about all that uh, kind of stuff because that sounds great. Well, this has been a really wonderful conversation, um, which I'm not surprised about because the book was really wonderful and folks should check it out. Uh, once again, it is Theologizing with the Sacred Prostitutes of South India Towards an Indecent Dalit Theology uh, with Brill Rodopi. Uh, you can check it there and please do check it out. Um, Eve, is there anything else you want to promote or draw people's attention to at this time? So there's a book coming out next year with SCM entitled Trust in Theological Education, um, Deconstructing Trustworthiness Toward a Pedi Pedagogy of Liberation. Um, right. so if people want to check that out next year, please do. But focus on this one. This one's nice and juicy. Yes, yes. There's plenty here to tide you until then. And, and then and then you all know that because we'll, we'll get you back on the podcast. But thank you so much for this conversation. And uh, yeah, and 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 I, don't know, I can't remember. I'm forgetting how I forget in these things. But thank you for the conversation, folks. We'll see you all next week. Okay. Thank you.